so hello everyone uh, welcome to uh, another session today uh, right now we have with us uh, professor Holzman. Uh, professor Holzman, we are really thrilled uh, to to have you here to address some focal points uh, concerning Austrian School of Economics. Uh, professor Holzman is a professor of economics at the University of Anger, uh, as well as a senior fellow of the Mises Institute. Uh, is also a first laureate of the France Coll Award and is considered one of the most influential economists within Austrian School of Economics here in Europe. Uh, is also one of the, the voices uh, for pluralism within uh, the profession. Uh, uh, for those of you, I would like to make a suggestion on a chapter of Austrian economics in the book Rethinking Economics, an Introduction to Pluralist Economics. Uh, after this is the second edition of Economics Week, uh, this opening day is about political economy. Uh, we are thrilled to explore to uh, heterodox school of thoughts. In the morning, we had uh, Professor Antonella talking about post Keynesian economics. And, to, and right now, we are going to focus on uh, Austrian School of uh, Economics. I would like to go now to, to our first question. And I'll also like to note that for those of you that, uh, that are here, you can, you can make questions in the, in the chat. Uh, and if you want later, you can uh, uh, say it yourself. Uh, and also, this is a collaboration with the Rethinking Economics Group at ISCTE. Uh, so now I'm going to, to ask the first question. Um, any economics theory comes from a, a context. That's one of the first logical steps to understanding the school of thought is to understand the history behind it. Uh, bearing this in mind, uh, when was Austrian School of Economics first in introduced and how did it change over time? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the good question. Uh, before I start off, I should uh, say uh, one word of thanks for, for, the, for this invitation. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. It's, it's true, it's very convenient to do this over the internet and to, to speak to the screen, but it's not very nice. I, so it's, uh, I hope that one day we'll come make this true, that uh, we meet in person and have a, have a discussion in, um, in, uh, in Portugal. Uh, economics and all the other sciences uh, do not only live off uh, pluralism, they also live off personal contact. Right? It's important to meet people. Um, now, the, your question is, so the Austrian school is uh, commonly dated back to 1871. And that year, uh, Karl Menger uh, published his book, The Principles of Economics, of course in German, so it's Grundsätze der Volkswirtschaftslehre, so that's the, the title. And uh, in that book, uh, he um, uh, set the theory of value and of price on new foundations. And the theory of value and price was one of the very weak points of classical economics. And uh, led uh, classical economics into various contradictions. The most famous ones was um, um, uh, the, the circularity in, in the argument. Right? If you want to explain uh, the, the prices of goods by their cost of production, as, as an, Adam Smith had uh, proposed to do, then of, you run into circularity arguments of the sort like if you want to explain the, the price of wheat, you explain it by the cost of production, you have to ask, okay, what explains the value of labor? And you say, okay, the value of labor is also explained by the cost of production. So what's the cost of production of labor? It's, well, it's among other things, the wheat intake, right? So the family needs to eat wheat and, 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 and the laborers need to eat wheat and so on. So then you run into a contradiction. That was one of the problems. The other big problem was that obviously there, there were some goods had great value, but were not produced at all, right? Things, precious stones and so on that you find on the beach or in the river, uh, right? So nobody has produced them, but they have as much value as other stones that have been produced under, under great efforts and, and so on. So uh, Kamenga proposed a way to get around this, uh, to solve this problem, and therefore to put um, uh, the theory of prices on a more sound footing. Right? So that was a starting point. And it's important that uh, uh, Menga's contribution was uh, reform, right? It was an improvement of classical economics. 
Now, I think we'll come back to, uh, to this point later on, right? He did not set out to propose an outlandish theory that has never been thought of uh, before, uh, something com completely different way of uh, thinking about economics. It was uh, rooted in classical economics as it had existed and in economics as it had devel developed from the Middle Ages, um, but improved it at its foundations, right? That was the initial project. And then the subsequent generations of Austrian economists have um, uh, improved that edifice, that theoretical edifice even, even further, right? By uh, developing most notably capital theory. Classical capital theory had one big flaw. There was no room in it for time, right? Uh, so when Adam Smith thought about capital accumulation, it was a very important, was the central mechanism of growth, right? Capital accumulation. Very much like in Marxist economics, uh, same thing, right? You know that Marx, of course, built also on, on classical economics and uh, tried to improve it, tried to re reform it. Um, and in um, the, the way Adam Smith had imagined cap capital uh, accumulation is, let's say you double the amount of capital, well, then you can invest twice as, mu as much and all people, uh, you get twice as many employees and they're all doing the same thing that they'd done before, right? So you have twice as much capital so you can, hire twice as many people, but they're doing exactly the same things that the people uh, have been doing so far, right? So you get as, twice as many haircuts and twice as many shoes and twice as many jackets and, and, and so on. And that's of course nonsensical, right? <laughs> because you don't want to prove the stuff that you've done in the past. Uh, because, okay, you can, can get sometimes some, some better quality, so it's worth a while sometimes to have better shoes and better screens and, and so on. But usually at some point you want to switch to something else with, that you haven't done so far. And you can explain this very well when you bring the time dimension into play. And that, that's as, uh, what, what Adams, uh, what um, uh, Böhm Barbeck, one of uh, uh, Menga's disciples did, right? He brought, he explained that capital is very strongly related to the passage of time. The investment of capital is related to the uh, passage of time. Then another big uh, contribution was uh, the theories by Ludwig von Mises. Uh, who is my favorite economist, and um, I'm sort of, sort of a specialist in, in the uh, theory, uh, in the thought of uh, Mises. I, I wrote a big book on Mises. Anyway, let me do a little advertising. Uh, yeah. 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 You see, you have to get a copy of this book. Right? This is Mises. Okay, this is the, the gentleman, right? You see, it's a big book, right? So you can buy it for more than one reason, right? I mean, you can learn economics from it and the history of economic thought, but you also can use it as a doorstopper. And if you have small children, right, you can sit them on the, on the chair and it's very practical. Uh, yeah, so uh, Mises um, uh, has been my favorite economist because he's really wonderful. It's a great economist, an encompassing mind who has thought through economics from the bottom from the foundations, right, in philosophy, epistemology, methodology, and so on, down to the, the very minute applications. So it's really a, a very admirable person. And Mises uh, started off by um, applying Karl Menger's theory, Karl Menger's value approach to the case of money. And starting from there, then he developed also a theory of business cycle. He developed a theory of um, uh, comparative economic systems, right, it was very much was a big practical problem at the time because there were socialist revolutions all over Europe. So the question was, was this a good, good idea, right? Was this a good thing? I mean, definitely capitalism uh, as, we, as we know and as people knew it at the, at the time was rather imperfect. So it was clear there was something fishy, there was something wrong. So what was wrong and what's, what's, what was the right thing to do? And, and Mises did not think that uh, establishing uh, central planning and totalitarianism was, was some, some sort of the, the opposite of pluralism uh, was the right way to go, but why, right? I mean, what, were the, uh, what was the reason for this? What, what were the theoretical explanation? So he um, developed a theory of um, economic calculation where he explained, well, socialist planners, they have this big, um, uh, knowledge problem because they, they, they cannot in fact direct uh, the economy as a whole. They don't have the information that they would need. The information that entrepreneurs use in their decision-making is generated through the operation of the market system, of the, of the competitive system. system right? So market price, what we're using to make decision, uh, economic decisions is to we rely on market prices. 
but these prices only come into being through uh, the operation of the system itself. If you take the system away, then the central planner doesn't have the, the raw material uh, to, to make decisions, right? So uh, you don't get all the, the, the various problems that are associated maybe with markets, but so you get something that is not better, but, uh, but even worse. Right, so these were some of the major uh, uh, stations um, and uh, e economists of the Austrian school, um, well, without going into further applications, let me just highlight one uh, major area in which they have been different from um, the, the mainstream to the present day, and this concerns um, uh, methodology. Right? Austrian economics is some sort of a continuation of uh, philosophical realism. Right, so the intellectual approach that comes from antiquity, from Plato and Aristotle, and then goes through the Middle Ages, uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, the scholastics, uh, the school of Salamanca. Right, so it's very close to, to Lisbon. And um, uh, which is very different from the, the, the mainstream uh, approach in economics today, which is positivist, right? And the distinctive mark of positivism is that you try to apply the same methods um, in research that you apply in the natural sciences, so in, in physics or in engineering and so on. That is ultimately you're treating human beings as if they were uh, inanimate objects, as if they were stones, as if they were reacting mechanically to outside stimuli. Right? That's, that's, that's the main idea of positivism. And that's why I have turned to Austrian economics because I found this absurd from the outside. I, I was coming from engineering, right? My, my initial training was, was in engineering. And I, I the, actually, the first thing that I liked about economics was uh, Keynesian macroeconomics. I liked the, the macroeconomic models. Uh, and it's because it's very uh, flattering to uh, young people with, uh, who, are, who are ambitious and who want to improve the world. Because if you learn uh, economics with Keynesian macroeconomics, you have the impression, well, the economy is some sort of a big machine, right? And so there are various levers and various buttons that you can push. And if you want to reduce unemployment, well, you need to do this and this, there's a button here and there's another lever there, right? There's various things and then things improve. Well, uh, this is just not how it works. And the reason is that we are animate beings, right? We have um, a mind, we make decisions, we have imagination, we have creativity. Uh, you, you cannot apply a um, uh, mechanical model to explain human behavior and hope that it will work. It just cannot work. So, but if there is something like creativity, is there, if there is something like human liberty, uh, decision making, and so on, uh, in what sense can there be something like an economic science? And that's the fundamental uh, question. Right? In, in physics, it's clear, it's, uh, right? Because there's a mechanical reaction. You let an object fall and it will drop at a certain speed in a certain time and so on. In economics, it's different, but we still have economic laws. What sense can you make of this, this notion that there are economic laws? Right? And the Austrians have given, in my eyes, have given the best response to this. Right? So they've been preserving the humanity of humans uh, while uh, at, the, at the same time coming up with a coherent um, explanation of the economy and of man within the economy as a whole. That was a long response to your first question. It, it was a long response, but it was certainly uh, very helpful and very insightful. And uh, of course, I was a bit more than, than a historical background and it did touch on a lot, a lot of the points that we meant to ask. But just to, to focus now on the principles that define the Austrian School of Economics. So uh, you've talked about the, the emphasis on, on man and human activity as the, the engine for the, the whole economy. So what other principles are applied in research within the, the Austrian School? Yeah, so we have, we have this uh, methodology, right? So um, in, uh, in human action, to study human action, you cannot apply the methods of physics, right? In physics, you have to presuppose that there be qu a constant quantitative rela uh, relationships, right? So you, then you come up with a model and you see whether the model replicates what you find in reality. That doesn't work uh, in, in economics. It, it's not just because I say so. I mean, uh, just look around. I mean, uh, economists have been trying to do this for 100 years. <laughs> They've never come up with any quantitative, uh, constant quantitative relationship, something like the law of Newtonian gravity or something like this, or 
like the, a, a Faraday's equation or something just doesn't exist, does not exist. Um, uh, so we have to do uh, uh, something different, right? We cannot presuppose that there be constant uh, rela uh, quantitative relationships. There are co uh, constant relationships, right? For example, if we choose something, uh, what we prefer to do has always for us a higher value than what we do not do, right? So I'm sitting here now, I'm giving a talk to this group. Uh, so obviously for various reasons, this has for me a higher value than not being here or well, uh, having a walk in the park or doing something else, right? So this value, value relationship that what we do is always more important to us than other things that we could have done, right? This is a constant relationship, but it's not a constant quantitative relationship, right? Or the fact there is also a time dimension to this, right? Where we do something, or the things that we do, we want to get the result earlier uh, rather than later and so on, right? So there are various relationships. Uh, some of these relationships are actually uh, well known. For example, if you think of um, um, the law of diminishing value, right? So Austrians call this the law of diminishing uh, marginal value. In uh, neoclassical economics, it's called the law of diminishing marginal utility. Right? And um, now the, the way Austrians would phrase this is somewhat somewhat different. Um, but I mean, the, the basic idea is that you have a if you have a larger stock of a homogeneous good. Then the value of each unit in that uh, larger stock is uh, lower than the value of each unit in the smaller stock. And the reason is that with the larger stock, you can do all the things that you can do with a smaller stock, plus you can do certain things on top of this. And the things they can do on top of this, they necessarily are less important to you than the things that you would have done only with the smaller stock. Right? If I have uh, five hours, uh, then I can do various things. So I can do more things than I can do in three hours. So all the things that I do on top of the, the between three and five hours, uh, well, they have value for me because I'm doing them, but they have less value for me than the things that I would, would have chosen to do if I had only three hours, right? So th there is a value relationship between the size of a stock of a homogeneous good and the value of each unit within the uh, homogeneous uh, stock, right? That is a constant relationship, but it's not a constant quantitative relationship. It's a constant uh, comparative relationship. And now, as, as I've explained in some of my methodological work, it's, it's a constant uh, counterfactual relationship. Right? This, is, this is very interesting from a philosophical uh, point of view, so, right? You, so you get to economic laws, but they're not of a quantitative sort as we have them in, um, uh, in the natural sciences. Um, again, now the, the, your question was, what are the, the founding principles? The founding principles are um, not uh, fundamentally different in Austrian economics than you uh, would have them in classical economics, right? Or in economics generally. Right? And Austrian, uh, so, I mean, Austrians have not tried to reinvent the wheel. They've tried to give the wheel a better quality, a more sounder uh, material, a more sounder foundation. So Austrians uh, also think that economics is based on um, the law of the laws of value, right? So diminishing marginal value and so on, uh, time preference, uh, and on the other hand, the laws of return, and that's what you would be typically be taught also in a, a class on microeconomics. But Austrians give a very different interpretation to these principles. For example, if you think of the law of di uh, diminishing marginal utility uh in you know, in standard economics and mainstream economics this has a, a psychological interpretation of the sort like uh say i'm drinking beer and i like the first beer more than the second one right the second beer also gives me satisfaction but less than the first one and the third still gives me satisfaction but less than the second one and so on right so my satisfaction diminishes and at some point i'm saturated with beer i can drink no more, or I, I don't like it anymore, and then it loses its value. And as I've explained to you just before, when I expose the law of diminishing marginal value, Austrians don't give a psychological interpretation, they give a practical interpretation, right? A praxeological interpretation. It's enshrined in the logic of action, it's not enshrined in psychology. And it's actually not true that um, they psychologically there's always a diminishing one satiation that's how it's called right that the pleasure that you derive from things uh, that it diminishes if the quantity increases 
right? Some people like the second and the third beer more than the first, right? Sometimes when you do readings and so on, you develop a taste for this uh, and you like greater quantities, uh, additional units like them more than just the first ones, right? So it's a different interpretation, but which makes it more universal uh, in, uh, in the application. It's a different take very often on economic principles. Um, Yeah, let's let, let's leave it there, right? So that, that's how I would put it, right? But it's not we're we're talking about the same animal. The reality is the same, right? Austrians are not in outer space. It's the same real world that we're talking about, and we're actually using the same way of uh, approaching of explaining the real world. But the interpretation that Austrians give to it is a realist one. It's not a psychological one. It's not a positivist one. I'd like to, to pick it up from there. Um, so, so we've talked about the main uh, foundations of Austrian economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, now let's go compare it to, to the mainstream, the neoclassical, let, let's say. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you've talked about the, the methodology. Um, um, and the, the idea the, the, that I had is, is that uh, the, the quantitative part is not uh, the, the major uh, aspect of, of Austrian economics. So no. how does... Uh, an Austrian economist looks at econometrics models and the evolution of the of those really complex uh, models. For example, yeah, uh, 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 Austrians do not expect the models to give answers. Austrians are interested in quantitative analysis. So I'm again right. So I come from engineering. So certainly I, I look at figures and stuff like this. But um, I look at figures in order to raise questions. And if you if you look at, at income uh, statistics, you see there is uh, well you see Gini statistics and, and so on, or sometimes you have econometric ma models of, of the sort. You get certain regularities. That's that might be more or less interesting. So the question is, why is this so? Right. So empirical studies bring up questions. They don't give answers. They could give answers, as in the natural sciences only if we could believe from the outset that there were quant uh, constant quantitative relationships. Right? In that case, empirical studies could give us answers about causal relationships. Uh, they would explain us why certain things are happening, but they cannot do it. Right? But you may study, again, income statistics and see, oh yeah, there's a widening uh, uh, income uh, distribution gap uh, and, and so on. Why is this so? then you need to come up with a causal explanation. And the econometric model does not deliver the explanation. Yeah. Um, but do, do you feel that the, or the, the neglecting or the discarding the mathematical tools can somehow be, um, uh, can somehow injure the, the research and, and the type of work that economists do in trying to come up with solutions. So of course, conceptually and philosophically, uh, everything uh, makes sense so far, but in, when it comes to the actual applications, do you feel that the, the lack of mathematical tools injures it somehow? No, I think uh, mathematics and economics is a distraction. It, it absorbs energies that are just wasted. I mean, it's, it's, it's an intellectual puzzle. You construe a model and you uh, try to uh, come up with good uh, parameters for an econometric model and so on to fit it to the data. Well, that's kind of interesting, but it doesn't really give you, a, it's not providing an explanation. If you come up with, a, if you cook up the right parameters for, for an economic, uh, uh, econometric model, you haven't explained anything. You have just construed a, a, a set of equations in such a way that it fits a, a, a data set that you want to bring into the model or to which you want to apply the model. That's not an explanation, right? So in my eyes, the, the, the basic problem is really that it, it's just a waste of, of time. It's just a waste of attention. Uh, lots of intelligence uh, are, are being absorbed by this sort of uh, purely formal puzzles. And people would better reflect on um, uh, real explanations on causal explanations, the different alternatives, right? Which brings us to uh, to pluralism and ch check them 
uh, on logical grounds and then also factual ground, right? Do the different uh, explanations, how do they deal with the facts? But of, because of course you would like a theory to, to deal with all the facts, right? To give a coherent and uh, um, plausible account of the facts. Right? So that's where pluralism comes into, in, into play. Right? You need to have competition, but you need to learn also a lot. I right? need you know, to be able to compare the different theories. That's where the real work is. And if you spend all of your time construing econometric models and doing little equations and so on, that's, it doesn't bring you closer to this, what you should really be doing. Uh, that reminds uh, a quote from John Robbins that says that uh, I didn't learn mathematics, so I had to think. And, uh, and I think that describes uh, pretty well what you just said. I'd like to move on to, to the next question that is about pluralism. Pluralism is the main idea of this whole week. Uh, so what I'd like to ask you is what do you think is the, uh, currently the environment of, of economics? Do you think that we are working to a more pl pluralistic uh, economics uh, uh, research uh, society, community? Uh, and uh, what do you think is the importance for uh, a pluralistic uh, curriculum for uh, uh, an academic uh, young student in uh, uh, learning? Thank you. Well, uh, my, my own experience is, is okay, greater than yours, but it's also very limited, right? So I've started uh, studying economics in the 1980s. And uh, well, I've been a professor now for 16, 17 years. And in that time, uh, I have the impression, yes, there is a move toward greater pluralism. And so economics was much more monolithic when I started off in, in the 1980s. So now it is possible uh, to bring into play a, great, a larger set of uh, approaches, assumptions, uh, hypotheses that you want to explore and so on. And people do this and they, they publish this and they, they construe um, careers. So it is possible. It's easier today than uh, 30, 40 years ago. That is my impression. Now, I have no quantitative, uh, uh, I have no statistics uh, to underscore. It's difficult to measure uh, all of this. But uh, let's say if you just look at the, uh, the number of journals and, uh, and professional journals, which you can publish, it has exploded uh, with the internet, right? In the past 25 years, just an amazing development. So uh, whereas uh, until the 1990s, you had a relatively small number of professional uh, journals, maybe 20 or 30 or so, right? Um, through which everybody had to pass. And as a consequence, the editors of those journals, they had, a, a, well, not a monopoly, but a, an oligarchic grip, right, on, on the profession. Uh, things have, uh, have improved, much improved in that respect, right? So it's, uh, of course, not perfect. You cannot expect this, but uh, I think it has improved. And for me, uh, the importance of pluralism, uh, well, it relies simply from the fact that, uh, it, it's from the fact that, well, we are not, uh, we are humans, right? So we don't know everything. There are various things that we do not take into consideration. And sometimes we go wrong, even when we think about those things that uh, we all dear, that are interesting to us. And, um, well, so we, we need to be corrected. And the, the easiest way to be corrected is to be corrected by other people who are looking at the same things that we are interested in, right? The same reality, but they have a different take. So, and if we are confronted with other viewpoints, well, we need to um, uh, come up with an explanation why we don't do what the others are doing. Right? How do we deal with, with the same facts? That's what we need to do, right? A cultivated person, a university person, uh, well, was, was supposed to do this, well, uh, from, from, from times immemorial, right? That's what you were supposed to do. And this is especially important in a discipline such as economics, because in economics, we are dealing with the economy as a whole. We are dealing with the interrelations between all the different parts of human activity. You cannot be a good economist by focusing only on the labor market or only on Chilean uh, monetary policy or something like this, right? You need to see the relation between that thing that you are currently studying, can be the labor market, can be monetary policy with everything else, right? Otherwise, you, you, you are 
becoming a pure pure technocrat, you, you're missing the, the essence of, of, of economics. And in economics, we are always dealing with a multiplicity of objectives, not only one objective, not only one problem, uh, but how they all interrelate through scarcity. Because uh, uh, economic goods, uh, resources are scarce, they're not available in such quantities as are sufficient to realize all projects. Uh, so necessarily, if we allocate them to one uh, uh, objective, to, to, to one end, well, they're missing elsewhere. Right? So there are repercussions, everything is holding together. And that's the job of the economist to uh, understand these interconnections and to make them understandable to students and to the lay public. Right? That's, that's our job. And if you look at the current uh, COVID policies and so on, this is the typical case where you have <laughs> so-called experts, right, in, in, in health and, and so on. They're looking at one thing, right? There's one problem and it's called health or whatever, or the epidemiology and, and so on. And then they are designing policies uh, that are geared toward the solution of this one problem, which is completely stupid. Right, at least anyway, from an economic point of view, and uh, certainly from a commonsensical point of view, right, you never subordinate everything to just one objective. Right, that, that's um, neurotic. Right, it's it's a distinct sign of a, a neurotic person. Right, there's some person who think, oh yeah, my hair is not good enough, and everybody is looking at my hair. I go out into the street. Yes, they will see right away that this hair is not at the right place, and so on. So they go go crazy about this, uh, and. Uh, Right, is is a little bit the same thing. If this obsession with one element and subordinate everything else to it, and in politics, unfortunately, this this tendency is uh, quite widespread because politicians stand for re-election, and so they tend to focus on those things that are currently in the news that are important for people that people talk about. Yeah, they want to get this done, right? And and so they 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 can do crazy things if you let them. Um, I think we have a question from one of our uh, viewers. Uh, where is he? Okay. Your, your sound is we're, not, we're not hearing you. Okay. I think he'll come back. Okay, but he's uh, <laughs> grabbing your plugs, I think. Um, so maybe we can uh, finish with the question and go now to, to some literature uh, recommendations uh, besides uh, your, your own book, which you uh, advertised already. Uh, are there any other or what are the main, uh, the main books or the main pieces of literature that we should seek to better comprehend the Austrian School of Economics? Uh, okay, let, let me answer in two steps, right? The, 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 there are two books that I would uh, recommend to every student, everybody who is maybe, maybe just studying business or something like this, or maybe uh, uh, family members who want to know more about economics and so on, uh, where should they start off? The, the two books that I would recommend for everybody to read, there, each of them has about uh, 150, 200 pages. So it's very uh, accessible. Uh, the one is a book by Henry Hazlitt. Uh, he was an American uh, journalist, self-taught person, uh, but a uh, very famous journalist in his time. And he published uh, in the late 1940s a book with the title Economics in One Lesson. And I'm sure there is a Portuguese edition of this as well. It has been translated in I don't know how many languages. It has been sold a couple of million times. Right? So it is really a very good book. And I, I uh, discovered it, unfortunately, only at the beginning of my doctoral studies. When I was uh, reading this, I said, oh, this is, this is uh, such a pity. I should have read this the first day, so was, right, the very first year. So I think uh, this is really a great way to start off. I mean, it's not perfection, right? No writer has it all right. right? This, this is ridiculous. But he, it gives you uh, an introduction to what economics is all about, what classical economics have been talking about, right? Um, uh, and, and the, the, the practical importance. So you know, he, he, does, he explains the application to policy problems. Right? So that is very important. And the other book uh, uh, is by an, an American economist that I appreciate very much. His name is Murray Rothbard, uh, R-O-T-H-B-A-R-D. And he has written a book uh, with the title, I don't like the title. The title is 
what has government done to our money? Uh, I don't like title study uh, of this sort, right? But it's typically it's it's uh, book publishers who come up with with titles like this because they want to sell, right? So they come up with silly titles like this. Uh, but the book is actually is really excellent. It's it's a wonderful introduction to money, and from an Austrian point of view, um, uh, one of the biggest problems that we have had in the past hundred years is a completely screwed up monetary system. Our monetary system is um, uh, what Austrian would call an inflationist monetary system. Right? So it, it is based on um, a very deep rooted and strong government interventionism, uh, which profits uh, not the economy as a whole, but the government itself and its business allies. Right? So monetary interventionism is just a disaster because it, it creates a corporatism, uh, it creates uh, mer mercantilism, right? uh, uh, mono tendencies toward monopolization. Everything that Marx has described about the, the market economy that is, is bad, right, is really, uh, maybe not 100%, but to 90%, it's due to monetary interventions, due to inflationist policies. They produce these kind of things, also very strong income equality and, and so on. And Rothbard explains this very well. Right? Not uh, completely, right? It's not encompassing, it's not a treatise, but you get this on 150 pages. You get a theory, the main building blocks of theory, and then you get a historical narrative. What has happened uh, since the 19th century up to our, our time? So the, these two uh, books, two books are great introductions to economics. And then uh, as far as Austrian economics, if you are really interested in the Austrian school, you need to read the great um, uh, treatises in economics, right? Because one uh, particularity of Austrian economics, and I've stressed this in my exposition today, is that uh, Austrians emphasize, well, you need to understand the economy as a whole. You need to get a, a feeling for the system as a whole, right? Not just a little policy here and a little institution there. You need to see economics as a discipline that deals with uh, society as a whole. And so therefore uh, economic treatises play a big role in Austrian economics because the treatise is the proper pr publication to bring to present the uh, relationship between all elements. Now the uh, big treatises are um, uh, is, is by Mises, right? It's human action, that is the main word. But this book has more than a 900 pages, right? So my, my book is also pretty big, right? But um, so this is more than 1100 pages, but it's a big print. Look at this it's big print. It, it's it's not uh, it's a light eleven hundred pages, right? Mises, you have nine hundred pages small print. That is terrible, right? But it, it's 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 a great book. But you need to re really come with a lot of enthusiasm for the study of economics to get from cover to cover. Right? And another book uh, by Rothbard. So I mentioned him with a small book, but Rothbard has published also a treatise on economics with the title, Man, Economy and State. Right. That is also 900 pages. Okay, so it, it's a big thing. And uh, let me also mention one, uh, okay, one other book by, by Mises or two other books by Mises. Um, the book that made him famous uh, has the title Socialism. And it presents uh, Mises' critique of socialist policies, policies designed to establish a socialist economy, socialist state. And it's really fantastic because you get lots of elements that they're dealing with uh, Marxist uh, thought and uh, interventionist thought uh, and so on. Right? So he talks about monopoly theory, uh, but he also talks about things like uh, the family. So it's something that relates to feminist economics, right? Uh, what, what's the relation of, of, of the genders within the economy and so on. It's a fantastic book. It's, it's not 900 pages, it's just 500 pages. But it's really, it's, it's a great read. And for those of you who are interested in theory, it's, it's really uh, very good. And for those who are more interested in philosophy, Mises has written two books. No, no other economist of the 20th century has, has written anything similar, uh, dealing with the methodological uh, uh, questions. I mean, today there are many economists who are interested in methodology and so on, but usually these are uh, specialists. They're doing only methodology, and that is a problem. Uh, it is a problem. 
uh, what, what you want to have is, uh, is an economist who is doing the actual economics, is doing the actual analysis, and then starts reflecting about methodology. If you do it the other way around, you become a specialist with, with a PhD uh, already, let's say in epistemology and, and methodology, that's the wrong way. Uh, it's the wrong way to go because uh, you're necessarily starting with the thoughts of other people. You don't try to understand the economy on your own first. Right? So therefore I discourage all my doctoral students from doing methodology and epistemology. You do this after when you're 40 or something like this or 50. You start off always with the, the real economy. Well, anyway, so Mises at the end of his life, he published two, at the end of his life, okay, published two books on methodology. One has the title, Theory and History. So, and that's an essay on um, uh, social and economic interpretation. So it, it discusses the various um, uh, approaches, right? Philosophy of history, positivism, um, uh, 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 historicism, uh, right? Uh, they deal with the interpretation of social reality and uh, criticizes and explains what, what, and how they relate to each other. And the other book is a smaller, 150 pages, which focuses on positivism. And the title is The Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science. And that is a fantastic book, it's very condensed, but accessible. It's not no technical jargon, jargon and so on. Uh, uh, in which he uh, uh, explains why the idea that you could can or should treat human action as uh, you would deal with stones and minerals and so on, right, like inanimate objects, is just complete nonsense. It doesn't put it this way, right? So it's it's, really, it's a very uh, scholarly uh, treatment, but it's it's a wonderful book if you have a philosophical fiber, if you have a, a philosophical uh, mindset. Yeah, so these, uh, and okay, let me, so I've mentioned uh, Mises and Hopper, let me also mention uh, one author that I appreciate a lot today, his name is Hans Hermann Hopper, H-O-P-P-E. Um, oh, he is a good friend of mine, uh, but he's, he's especially uh, a great economist. I have a look, I and mean, he has become, um, uh, uh, famous, infamous, uh, uh, by publishing a book with the title "Democracy: The God That Failed." Okay, was it, it was published in two thousand one. Uh, he has a very he has a <laughs> he has a knack for being provocative. He likes to provoke people. Okay, so it's my it's not the best way to uh, best uh, place to start Hopper, the studying Hopper. But you should read another book that he published ten years ago, uh, before with the title, The Economics and Ethics of Private Property. That's about 250, uh, 300 pages. And it, uh, it deals with um, uh, some of the fundamental problems of uh, contemporary economics, right? Uh, especially in, as far as practical application of uh, concerns. So public goods theory, uh, monopoly theory, uh, things like this, right? And especially of also welfare, welfare economics. Uh, Hopper has argued, and I think he has demonstrated this actually, that um, uh, you have in, 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 in normative economics and welfare economics, you have this idea that you can come up with explanations of policies uh, uh, starting from um, uh, the values uh, held by the different market participants. And right? so you come up with a model for their um, uh, utility function, right? You have utility, uh, individual utility functions and you start aggregating them and you have the, the aggregate utility function or something of the sort, right? And, and Hopper says, well, all of this makes no sense. And you, you cannot compare individual uh, values. Right? When human beings come to terms when they solve conflicts, it's never on the basis of value. You can never say, well, my values are more important or higher or, or sooner than yours. Well, of course, when we talk like this, it's immediately obvious that it would be nonsensical. But at bottom, what we do in, in, in welfare economics, normative economics is very often just that, right? We presuppose that we can compare your values and mine and say, well, mine's are three quarters as important as yours or something like this, which is nonsensical. 
And Hoppe says, so the only way we really resolve these problems is by sorting out uh, that what is just. Right? So justice is not derived from economics. Justice is primordial. First, you have justice. And when you know what is just, then you know what each one owns and what each one may legitimately do. And then you've already answered the question that you are pretending to solve with the help of uh, economics. You don't need economics uh, to answer this question. You actually cannot use economics to answer this question. All that you are doing is to come up with ideology, right? You, you cloud ideology in some sort of a mathematical model, but it just the model just reflects what you think should be done, which is not a solution to a conflict, right? In a conflict, you need to come with a just solution that settles uh, the, the claims of all people who are involved in one way or another. So Hopper has explained this very well. So I definitely recommend his books as well. Okay, uh, thank you. I think uh, Vasco is now ready to-, to yeah, Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Sorry about that. Well, first of all, Professor, it's very good to have you here. Uh, I think the talk has been very interesting. And now I, I would like to ask you to maybe elaborate a little bit further about the Austrian view of money and how do you think centralized money actually harms us? And um, I would also uh, wanted to ask you uh, if you think that in the, maybe in the next two or three years, we're going to have uh, high inflation because of the very expansionist monetary policy uh, being made by the ECB and the Federal Reserve. So yeah, that's my, that's my question. Okay, uh, let me uh, take this in reverse order. Yes, uh, definitely. I mean, if you look at the long run record, then it's very clear, right? That um, if you, in the course of time, uh, the, the money supply is, uh, is just increasing, right? It's, it's, it's not stabilizing, it's, no, it's never going down. So it's always going up. And uh, uh, which brings us to the, the loss of utility and the loss of value that we talked about before, right? If you're some uh, one good that the, the stock increases all of the time, well, it becomes less and less valuable. Each unit becomes less and less valuable. So in a, in a way, it's, it's normal that uh, money prices go up. That's the natural consequence, right? In the long run, it's unavoidable. Now, well, how much are prices going up within the next uh, six months or, or 12, uh, 12 months? That's more difficult to say because there are lots of other factors that come into play, right? Uh, for example, think of the crisis of 2008, 2009. Um, uh, at the time, the central banks were greatly increasing their uh, uh, money production, okay? But a central bank money, uh, economists call this base money, right? It's just one component of the overall money supply, right? So if you had just looked at base money, well, you, it was going through the roof. But if you look at the overall money supply, it was just actually following the usual growth path. So as a consequence, there was not really that much uh, of price inflation in 2008, 2009. It was rather stable. And in, in some countries, there were actually also deflation. Maybe, maybe you had deflation in, in Portugal uh, in, in those years. And um, wait, wait, I need to shut this up. Uh, and um, uh, because there's also the, the, the influence of the demand for money, right? <laughs> so sometimes in a crisis, people are hoarding more cash. So even though there's much more money available because they are hoarding more cash, well, there's no impact on the price level, right? So in the short run, there are all kinds of things that can happen. In the long run, uh, it's always, uh, it's unidirectional. Now, why is monetary interventionism, why is this a bad thing, right? I mean, Austrians uh, so would typically make uh, uh, three points, right? So first thing is you actually don't need more money. You cannot enrich yourself collectively with more money. Now that sounds strange uh, for us today because uh, we have had uh, 50 or 100 years of relentless Keynesian propaganda, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, you know, there's a reason why you don't find Keynesian propaganda in uh, uh, ancient philosophy, Aristotle, uh, Plato, and so on. I mean, none of them believe that you need more money in order to create, improve the common good of, of, of society, right? And the reason, of course, well, uh, that, that you cannot eat money, you cannot uh, dress yourself with money, and so on. Money is just a medium of exchange, right? But you can exchange unlimited quantities of other goods for money uh, only depending on the price level at which you exchange, right? Currently we have a certain price. So let's say all prices were half as 
uh, as high as they are today, then with the same amount of money, we could exchange twice as many goods. Right? So it's, it's really not the quantity of money that, that limits the amount of real exchange, right, of other goods that we can exchange for money. And that was uh, one of the, actually, you see, Adam Smith was a revolutionary, right? Adam Smith, um, he understood this and uh, he was reacting against his environment, which was very um, uh, uh, Keynesian as in our day, right? In Adam Smith's day, uh, all the people writing about money, they were all proto Keynesians, they were like Keynes. They're saying, well, money actually makes the world go round, right? Uh, the spending of money is the driving engine of, of the economy. Right. And Adam Smith, also he comes from philosophy, he's a moral philosopher, and at the time there were no economics departments and so on. He was just writing one book on economics. Like, it's like uh, Condillac in France, he's another great economist of those days, just one book on economics. And that's because you come from philosophy and say, oh, well, what are these guys talking about? This is complete nonsense. How can you grow rich by printing more pieces of uh, tickets, right? paper tickets? It's just ludicrous. And so he explains, well, actually, uh, how does it come that the economy grows? And Adam Smith says, well, the economy grows because we are saving more and there's a greater division of labor. There's nothing to do with the spending of money. Right? And uh, <laughs> no, no, I lost the track of, uh, of the question. Oh, yeah, so, right? so the Austrians, they take this up and they say, yes, I mean, that, that's correct. Right? So we cannot enrich ourselves collectively by printing more money. So what's the point? Why do uh, governments do this? Why have they done this from uh, the, the origins of our times? Well, that is because of the redistribution effects of money creation. By printing more tickets, by creating more money out of nothing, it's not that everybody becomes more rich, but some people become more rich at the expense of others. Right? And in, uh, in modern, uh, today's economics, we, we are calling this um, the Cantillon effects. After Richard Cantillon, so it's an 18th century French economist, was the first guy to uh, describe this, right, to analyze this. And Cantillon says, well, if you increase the money uh, stock, well, then prices will rise. Ultimately, all prices will go up. But in the, in the, in the, uh, the first thing that happens is that some prices go up more than others. Right? So as a consequence, some prices go up more than others or rise earlier than others. And as a consequence, you, you get redistribution effects. You have winners. These are those people who sell at prices that go up quicker or stronger than the prices at which they buy. Right? But of course, not everybody can be in this position, right? If there are some people who are in this position, there must be others who are in the opposite position. The prices at which they sell go up later or less strongly than the prices at which they buy. So they're winners and losers. Now, in the, in the case of money production, uh, this winning and losing uh, actually concerns the first users and the last users of money. Right? If you are a friend of the central bank, uh, I'm joking, right? You're a business partner of the central bank, right? You, you have, you're a big commercial bank, you're JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or Deutsche, I don't know what the big banks in, in Portugal are. Uh, it's the same thing, right? So you get credit. You are the first beneficiary of money production. You get, you, right? You're getting this new money at artificially low interest rates or at artificially good conditions. So you are, can, uh, are in the position to spend the new money first while its purchasing power is still high. And then it spreads throughout the economy. All prices go up eventually, right? Uh, and so every, all revenues also increase because if you, if there's an increase in price, there's also an increase in revenue for somebody, right? For the persons who are selling. Now, eventually everybody, almost every, uh, everybody will have a higher income. But during the time uh, uh, that is needed for money to spread, some people need to pay already higher prices for gas, for housing, for uh, food, right? Uh, while their revenues have not yet increased. So they are losing. Right? And that's, of course, the, the people of all people who are living on fixed income, uh, of all people who are uh, working far away from financial markets and from monetary policy and so on, they are losing, they're being ripped off. Right? So, uh, I mean, but, but that explains why governments have always intervened from antiquity over the Middle Ages to the present day. It was never different. The mechanism is always the same. Right? It's not because, well, uh, you cannot enrich the country as a whole, therefore we just leave it, we're not interested in this, ah, but we can enrich, enrich ourselves. 
So we're doing it and we're just spreading uh, lies or we're, we're spreading uh, crazy theories that explain why it should be good for everybody to increase the money supply. And that's what they've been doing. Okay. And then Austrians, okay, so this is a, a point that was the second point that Austrians would, uh, would emphasize. And the third point would be that such policies tend to be destructive um, uh, for, for different reasons. One reason that has been explained by Mises with this business cycle theory. I, I don't have time to explain it now, but you look it up, right? The Austrian business cycle theory, All right? So that's one reason. So Mises explains that, uh, well, in, in very short terms, it says, um, it says that, um, uh, artificially low interest rates, they're created by central banks, uh, they stimulate econo economic activity in the sense that you get people to uh, initiate more projects. But because we have no more real resources available in the economy as a whole, it is impossible to terminate all those projects, right? It's impossible to bring them to completion. Right? Uh, let's say, I mean, I get additional credits and so on, though I can start a business. But if I don't get funding throughout the time that I need, uh, then I cannot complete my, my, my business. I cannot bring it to fruition. Right? And the kind of funding that I need ultimately is not money. What I need to have to, uh, well, to bring it to fruition is to have real resources. I need to have people who work for me. I need to have uh, raw materials that I can buy. I need to have equipment that I can buy. But uh, central banks do not create raw materials, people, uh, uh, quali qualifications, and so on. All they create is money. So they give you some money at the beginning. You can buy stuff. Yes, but then if prices go up and uh, the prices of uh, your factors of production become too high relative to your income, well, you're, you're, you're burnt. Right? So that's what uh, one point that Visa said. In my own work, I've emphasized a different um, uh, problem, uh, namely the moral hazard problem. Uh, so I've, I've always emphasized that uh, central banks, th this redistribution right, that benefits some at the expense of others creates moral hazard on the side of the beneficiaries. Right? The money beneficiaries know that the central bank is there to help them. So as a consequence, they start doing very silly things. I mean, very smart things as far as they are concerned, but very silly things as far as the economy as a whole is concerned. Right? And uh, the, the standard example is the behavior of commercial banks. B commercial banks are uh, operating uh, financially in suicidal terms. They have very low equity and very low uh, cash reserves. Right? That's no, no, and you find this only in the financial industry. You find this nowhere else. Right? They're operating with 5% equity ratio. I mean, 5% equity ratio. The, the economic purpose of equity is, uh, is um, a buffer, right, F against error. You're not omniscient, right? You're, you're a human being. I mean, you, you screw up all the time, so you need to have a buffer uh, to keep going and to survive if your speculation was wrong. But they're operating at 5%. That's angelic, right? <laughs> and some of them have been operating at 1%, right? That's near God. Uh, I mean, this is just absolutely, and, and, and the reason is not that they are so smart, of course, they, they always fancy themselves to be very smart and so on, but they're not. <laughs> I mean, what, what's really happening is that, uh, so they apply the little silly models and, and their investment strategies and so on, and I always ask them, so you think this is uh, uh, this, the science of finance, right? So you know, you know how to uh, turn a buck, yeah, we know how to do this, yeah, until you don't, right? And then you need the central bank to bail you out. So you have this every five years, every 10 years, you have the central bank bails out the financial industry right? because it does not work. Right? So the only reason why they can do this is because they have the central bank behind them. So, and if they have the central bank behind them, then it makes perfect sense. You operate with 5% uh, equity and with 1% cash because that way you can invest everything and you can get the maximum uh, of revenue and a profit, uh, profit for yourself. Right? So these would be the, the points that, that Austrian raised about monetary intervention. It's just very destructive. It's uh, uh, despicable from a, a moral point of view. Uh, it's, complete, it's complete illusion. Right? So, and, and, uh, but unfortunately, their huge, huge resources are invested um, to, um, to fund this and to uh, defend the system and to prevent criticism and so on. Big problem. Thank you uh, once again, Professor, for all the incredible answers that you have provided so far and all the recommendations. Uh, 
unless there's any further questions, which I don't think. Okay, uh, Vasco wants to to pose another question if that's possible. We're yeah, uh, we're getting short on time, so I would uh, ask. Yeah, just one one final keep question. It somewhat what? simple. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to know what's your take about Thomas Piketty's work on inequality and capital accumulation. He says that we should start taxing wealth and redistribute, uh, redistribute it as much as possible. Uh, what do you think about it? Yeah, I, I think it's, 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 it's interesting from an analytical point of view. We talked about uh, econometrics and, and statistics before, right? And Thomas Piketty has never done anything else in his life, but <laughs> do a lot of statistics and econometrics, and then jump from there to left-wing policy conclusions. That's a little thin, right? So I like his work as far as the analytics are concerned because for me, it raises questions, uh, right? So why is this so? And I have very different answers from he, he says. He's, oh, we get this uh, uh, income uh, divide because we, we tax people less. Well, uh, my answer would rather be we get this income uh, divide because we have this very interventionist monetary policy. Uh, and, and other policies that are designed to enrich the cronies of the government at the expense of other people or at the expense of ordinary people. Now, he never talks about these other things. That's very regrettable. You see, I, I have no issues with him pointing to facts, so that's that's okay. But you need to take into account the, uh, the all the facts, right? And sometimes he has been uh, asked, uh, so what do you think about monetary policy? And so, yeah, yeah, that has an influence, he always says. It has, it has a big influence. <laughs> But you know, explains which one. <laughs> so yeah, that would that would be my thing. I, it's it's, um, it's uh, he's he's uh, 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 exquisite uh, illustration of the of the problems that we have in present day uh, mainstream research. Right, it's too positivistic, so you get this focus on data, but you have no explanation. Right? Data don't give you answers; they raise questions. Okay, I think that's a, that's a terrific note to to end on. Thank you, Professor, for for joining us. It was extremely insightful. Uh, thank you also to to everyone uh, present here. So I will now uh, end the session and thank you once again for all your time and cooperation. My pleasure. And all the insight that you've uh, brought. It was it was very interesting. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. Enjoy the rest of your week. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you.